thank you, Handmail, for having me. Uh, yes. So, uh, first of all, I work with a little studio called 100 Rabbits. Um, so the studio is uh, just a small collective of two. We operate it from a small sailboat, and, uh, which is solar powered, and all of our devices are donated, uh, discarded device, like the one that I, that I had here that didn't work. That's, an, that's a sort of a trend in the way we do things. Um, but our philosophy is that to make uh, fast software, you need slow computers. And we've tried to espouse this as much as we could. Um, me and my partner. And um, Rekha couldn't be here, but says hi. Uh, we spend our time uh, sailing around and doing experiments with uh, re resilience. And that covers uh, computers, but also our main focus is also uh, food, food security, uh, trying to do preservation, uh, studying maybe technologies that from the past that we could use today in times of crisis. We've, um, yeah, the time is not going, going forward here, so I'll, I'll, I'll just speak as long as I can then. <laughs> um, so we started sailing uh, seven years ago, and we, it took us all around the Pacific. Uh, we went through Mexico, all the islands in the Pacific. Uh, we went to New Zealand. Then we sailed up through Fiji, went to Japan, and then followed the, the Russian coast, and then Alaska and back. And uh, our thinking was that uh, we could keep doing, well, keep ha doing the things we used to do before, uh, either art, music, uh, video games, that sort of things, as we, were, as we would sail around. And it soon became uh, obvious that all the technology that we took for granted would we would be able to take with us uh, was not designed to leave the Western world. So the moment you cast off from Mexico, it seems that all of our devices start breaking down. You know, like Abner was really uh, trying to make the point of like the Roomba starting to fail. Uh, but if the Roomba starts to fail, you pick up a broom. But uh, on a sailboat, uh, you depend on finding your position, knowing the weather, things that has a more direct impact on your survival, and all of that technology is built on the same stack as the Roomba, basically. Um, and uh, so all Apple products broke almost in instantly, and uh, all the tools that we thought we, we, we could rely on broke down, all the subscription services, all the DRM things, everything that uh, I mean, in some cases, you think you, you, you develop a skill, right? Like a, you, you become a Photoshop uh, illustrator, and then suddenly that skill that you thought you had was actually entirely owned by someone. And even though we've been paying for the software for years, the moment that you can't have access to validate, authenticate yourself, well, that skill is taken away. And this we, we didn't expect, and it really scared us. Um, it seems that for a few years, uh, we, we've been building all, everything on the cloud. Uh, all the, the, you go to conferences like, like this, we would be, we, like along the coast, we, as we would sail, we would be invited to XOXO or some other conference to, to see all the, the happenings in tech. And you speak with people at the booths, and they're excited about their new product or whichever they're working on. And then we're like, we'd be like, what, what, let me just stuff you right there. Like, does, does it work offline? And like. 99% of times people would say, oh, yeah, sorry, it's some sort of SaaS thingy. And uh, it seemed that nobody anymore, for m many years, have been building things that we could even use in our lives. And I thought that was kind of a sad realization, especially, uh, especially that, uh, I mean, I love programming, and for a time it seemed that it was utterly incompatible with our, our new way of life. And uh, so we started to look what options was out there. Oh, I think, yeah, just before I say it, before, just before this. Um, to, to, to give you a picture of what it looks like to try to ha use um, modern stack in places where you're not supposed to, uh, imagine two people on a small sailboat in the tropics, maybe something that looks like Marquesas, South, South, uh, 
South Pacific places, beautiful uh, lush forests, and us trying to lift a smartphone in a Ziploc bag up the mast, so we'd have one bar of signal trying to update Xcode, which at the time was <laughs> 11 gigs. <laughs> and, and we had this stack of two gigabyte mobile data, and Xcode, you can't resume download if it fails. So, but we could swap the, down, the codes for the cards. If we did it within 10 seconds, uh, it, would not, it would just detect maybe a bit of a timeout and it would continue. But the problem is that if, you've, if you're not done by six o'clock, then the sun is setting and then our batteries are dying. And if we're at like seven gigs and we have three more, three more hours uh, of, download, of download at at these little cards things, and it just seems like after a while it just was just silly, and we we, we tried to look for alternatives. All right, so what we noticed is that all the software that we had written in the past was gradually becoming uh, unusable, and uh, we were thinking that well, it's either we do like every like so. So we we grew up in Montreal, and all of our friends uh, there work in in these uh, Ubisoft, AAA studios, or uh, free to play games, that sort of stuff. And in most cases, they're building games and projects that have a, a lifespan of maybe three years. And the project that, the project that we did in the past uh, on the Apple stack, on, on on Electron, on Unity, they also had something like three or four years of lifespan. But it was surprising that we could play uh, Super Mario, uh, any classic NES games, this sort of era of games, perfectly fine. But then it seems to be a sort of like a like a dark age where you will never be able to play Scott Pilgrim on the PlayStation again. They're, like all these games that people spent years build, putting putting together, uh, just suddenly became unavailable, and uh, we we didn't want to participate in this, and we starting to look online. It seemed other people had this sort of concerns. And uh, so we, we, we were looking at what options was, was out there. So I'm not gonna read this, but it seems to be there's like four philosophies of digital data preservation, and they all have their flaws. And uh, obviously none of those uh, survive. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of a new uh, field somewhat. Uh, we have no idea what uh, sort of data we'll be able to recover in 100 years. But from the experiments that I've looked at, so the, the, the BBC had this project where they were trying to mimic the, one of their longest lasting book. It was called the Domesday Book. So it, it was like something written by monks a, a few thousand years ago. And they were like, well, if we still have this book today and we can still read it, then do we have technology to, to make this, to make something like it? Like, do we have a, a way to record our, li our way of life today, that some people in a few tons, thousand years can see how we live, how we used to live, what, this, what sort of work we did, that sort of things. And they made this project, was called the BBC Domesday, and uh, they recorded the music and movies and uh, all these papers and things, and they would put it on this big disc, and uh, something like 10 years later it was un unreadable, and people forgot how to decrypt and decompile, and, and it seemed that there was a big, there was no, no viable solution, and so we wanted to try our own little experiment. Uh, as a disclaimer, uh, I mean, all of this that I'm gonna tell you today is extremely naive. I'm uh, more of an illustrator, maybe a musician. Uh, I didn't even have the vocabulary to find what I was looking for. Uh, just seeing Bob here, I, I, I was like, geez, if I knew this was a thing. Like, I didn't know what virtual machines were, but I didn't know what comp compilers were. I had an, a vague idea of what programming was, uh, I had written Swift and Objective-C and all this sort of garbage, and I had no conception of how it actually tied to processors. It seemed like it was, a, it seems I was learning a service, the same way I was learning Photoshop, which it was a service. It wasn't really like learning a skill. You don't learn to draw. You learn how to operate within the, 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 the restraints that the confines of, a, of someone else's playground, basically, and if that rug is pulled from underneath you, you there's nothing you can say. And you don't you never really understood how it worked in the first place, so you can't really replicate it. So we st we ev eventually I stumbled on the word virtual machine, 
and it seemed like, well, I know the, the soup that Mario brother and yes file, uh, I put it on this computer and I can run it. I can run it on my phone. I can run it on this other computer. It runs on an old computer. I can run it on a Super Nintendo. I can run the Super Nintendo emulator with running Mario on a Nintendo 64. Uh, and, and this seemed really interesting and a good way of preserving data. So I was like, could we s not give up entirely on software and see what can be done in that space using virtual machines? So uh, <laughs> hardware is extremely cheap and it's covering the world with e-waste and all of it is there for the taking. Like you, you, I'm, sure, I'm sure you have drawers full of all this Super Nintendo, PlayStation things, and all of those are somewhat obsolete. People stop developing for them. But we thought we could probably give a second life to this old DS that we had. Um, and looking into how this could be done uh, sort of led us into all these different interesting, pla in, in the interesting places. Um, we became really interested in seeing how you could repurpose um, old electronics. There didn't seem to be any competition. Like, obviously, if you if you do like everyone else, you're competing with everyone else, all right? So, so if you wanted to do like I iOS 10 or whichever now it is uh, software, then the, the marketplace is like completely saturated. But if you're going to release a Atari game today, you know, like, it's going to be huge. Like, there's basically no one giving a purpose to these devices anymore. So we we tried to do something completely left field, I, I, I guess. And uh, so our goal was to try and make games for the DS. So looking at uh, VM from the, from the outside, uh, not having a sort of academic background, you, you look it up, and then the first thing you find is the GVM, and not uh, not knowing, I've never written any Java, but I would go around and tell my friends who are pro actual programmers and be like, oh, I'm going to make the GVM. Uh, it seems like this would solve our problem. It'd be like, ah, GVM is fucking, it's, it's so uh, fractalized, and, and it, this is not uh, what you want to do. And so there were other things. So we, we'd find academic papers with no software written for them. Uh, yeah, I, I sort of dabbled into the Java, the Java ecosystem, and I didn't, couldn't make head or tails of it. Uh, but I knew that we wanted to make playful little project that could run on all the devices. But a sort of cross-platform that was not Electron. A sort of cross-platform that was like, instead of always targeting the new modern thing, I was like, maybe we can try to make a VM or some sort of thing that could run increasingly further back in the past. Because there's an incredible amount of fast computers. Like the first, the first time I made an NES game, I was surprised how much stuff I could draw on the screen at 60 FPS. And I was sort of, I had somehow been convinced that, that modern technology was better, faster, and all the 8-bit stuff had been a solved problem. So we had explored entirely this problem space. And it, it didn't seem to be the case. It seemed that uh, there were a lot of ideas in the past that were forgotten. And uh, I made it a, a sort of mission. I gave, I mean, it was COVID. I was like, okay, so we're going to take two years and figure out how computers work. And uh, we're going to look in the past how people did it and uh, what ideas were forgotten. There were, there were a time where computers were super playful. And um, it seemed now that uh, it became really cold and, and, and sort of like weaponized against people. Uh, the sort of playfulness that you'd find during Microsoft Bob I can't really find a parallel today. I can imagine what pr I can imagine what this would look like today. It would try to sell you all, sor all sorts of shit, but uh, <laughs> I don't think we have, the f like, as, as a society, a, a system in place that would foster the creation of something as playful as this. My one of the realization that I had working on something like this was that customizing your, your hardware and your software uh, makes you care. So obviously, if you buy something off the shelf and you, like, you, you get this, this iPhone device which you can't change, uh, you, have, you are more, more less likely to care for it and it's going to more likely end up in a drawer. But devices that people could actually change, customize, the, these the Altair, the computers that they, you go to Radio Shack and be like, I want two of this, one of that, and you go home, you knew it entirely. Uh, these devices are still loved. And uh, although your iPhone 6, you don't know where it is, it's probably unusable, it can be repaired, it's designed so to fail in ways that is unscrutable. And uh, 
So we were thinking, instead of trying to make things as broadly accessible as possible, uh, let's try to see what we could do if we designed it for just one person. A sort of personal computing that was not designed to scale. Um, I mean, I can see the, the appeal of you know, uh, Rust and all these languages that uh, I don't, uh, I won't be learning. But, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, if you're if you if you're convinced that you can use computers to solve problems, then obviously this will not uh, be relevant to you. But I don't think that if you're forced to be using computers, it can be playful in any way. There was a writer who said, "If you're forced to play, you can't play." And right now, I don't have a phone, a smartphone, and you walk in the city here and it's all these like Lime scooters and you go to a menu and it says, oh yeah, you want to see the menu, just scan this uh, QR code thing and there's a layer of, of reality that's being forced onto uh, people to use technology and this is not what I'm talking about here. What we're trying to do is something that is more closer to a personal computer, something that would be designed to and tailored to helping you play. Um, when we began looking at what VMs and things like that were, we, we looked in the past and that brought me to uh, Smalltalk. Uh, I read this book called uh, uh, What the Dormouse Said and it said it talked about the history of Stanford and how people had this utopian idea at the time of what computer could be and uh, this is way before I even became interested in computers and learning what their vision was then made me really sort of optimistic about what could be done. Uh, but that was one of the first time that I was exposed to the idea of, of even a virtual machine or bytecode. Or like you look, you, you look up without, the like looking things up online without the vocabulary you need to find things is, is really difficult. But this was, you couldn't, you, like there was no way I could go around learning about personal computing about, without spending some time learning small talk. Obviously, the moment that you start going that, down that route, you get all these nerds, like, you really have to try these machines. So you, you learn about symbolics and the LVM and like th this sort of system, which, which was trying to be a very personal way of doing computing, where the whole system could be inspected. Nowadays, it's akin to the browser, where you, where you can go on a website that you like, you right-click, inspect, you figure out how, well, it's less and less the case now, but for a while you could inspect, see how it, it's put together, and this was empowering in ways that I think that era was trying to create. Uh, this doesn't work on a VM at all, but it's relevant because uh, Nicholas Wirth, who, who wrote, uh, that's, o that's Oberon, uh, the, he wrote uh, an entire operating system that came with a book, uh, and the, the, the Oberon book is, is really nice, uh, especially if you don't, if you come in, in it with a clear mind, without prior knowledge or expectation of what programming is, well, the book explains how to build an operating system from scratch. Uh, it uses a language like Pascal, which is very easy to read. It's more beautiful than, than C and these sort of al other algo language. Um, and one of the first things that it teaches you to do this, uh, with this operating system is to draw pictures, which I thought was kind of interesting as a, someone who's very visually inclined. Nicholas Worth in the book, he mentioned something like uh, the P machine, and I was trying to—I was, I was beginning to form an idea of what virtual machines were at the time. Uh, and he just briefly mentions it, like, "Oh, I wrote this Pascal, P, this Pascal compiler, targeting a, v, a virtual machine." And I was like, "A language can target a virtual machine? What?" And the reason why it was so easy for him to port the compiler between platforms is that the the opcode running it were extremely simple and very few in numbers. And I was like, this is a way to do data preservation that is appealing to me. So I went and learned Pascal. And uh, Pascal is a beautiful language. This I'm, I'm running it here in an emulator for the Macintosh. And I loved that I could have a whole operating system running in a small window that wasn't Linux, that wasn't uh, when uh, some other big Camus images, it was just a little self-contained system. I could destroy it and start over really quickly. Right now we have access to really fast computers. I could run it and do 3D at 60 FPS by running the emulator at 128 times its speed. And I thought that was cool. Um, that led me to learn about the history of C, which uh, I had 
no really understanding of. And uh, so I, I, I migrated all my platform to Plan 9, which is probably why I can't use my laptop right now. <laughs> uh, and uh, Plan 9 has its own C compiler, and it's nothing like C80, well, it's not quite C89, but it's its own thing. It's a, it's a no concession sort of system. Obviously, the people who built this, built this they didn't want, they, I don't think they were planning to make money with it. Uh, but you can really tell that it's a product of love. And that really made me optimistic about what personal computer, computing could be. Plan 9 didn't, work, didn't run on IBM, but it inspired another system. The lessons that they learned doing Plan 9 led them to build something called Inferno. And that does run on IBM. And I was, it was sort of like all these ideas were coming together and all at this point where I was like, well, I think I'm starting to understand what VMs are. And if this entire operating system runs on a VM, this is what I want to be doing. And the scale of the, that operating system is, uh, of that VM is quite big, uh, but you would, I could go in, a, in, a, in an afternoon, run through the whole C code for the this virtual machine, which this is the opcodes that it had. And it was in part inspired from the actual hardware that ran the Newton. Um, but I could run it in an afternoon and know exactly how it ran. And then I would look at the compiler that, that targeted the this uh, virtual machine and I could see how they reduced the problem space to a limited number of operations. Uh, everything that, we're, that I was trying to unlearn, like, like my, everything moving to the cloud, it seemed that uh, people who worked really hard in the past to get away from time sharing system would, would laugh or, or they would cry at how we sort of like got tricked into falling back in that situation where computers were something that was done behind a wall. You'd have a terminal and that, that's where the, the con the, your power ends. I, <laughs> I wanted a, a way of doing computers that nobody could take away from me. And I, I would read about these people who would write operating, entire operating system on a weekend and I couldn't even map this idea onto things I was seeing. There was no, there was sort of like a bridge was missing. And uh, I think that even though the modern t stack doesn't really work for us, it doesn't apply in, in the limitations that we have on the boat. We have 180 watts of solar. Uh, we, we, we just spent the whole summer with uh, two six volt batteries, which is very small. And everyone's all the time, when, when you're like, Going down that route, you know, like obviously this two weird sort of two two year sort of ad adventure into computing history. Uh, every turn, people are like, "Well, you should just put more solar panels, or or buy more batteries." Uh, um, and that is such a modern way of solving your problem. But in reality, uh, technology like this, especially like high tech stuff, rarely solves the problem. It creates a lot of other problems. And on a sailboat, it's very immediate. Putting more solar would mean more windage, more chance of things flying off and cutting our limbs off. More batteries would mean the boat would be heavier. It would, it would stop us from being able to run away from storms. And the limited space of the boat gives us a space for uh, creativity. Its, its limitation became a sort of like a, a playground for us. Um, I am not the sort of programmer who could build Plan 9 or Oberon or Lisp machines and but I know that I could write simple NES games and port them around. Uh, now my, my thinking was that, well, I can't write an NES game inside an NES game and this is such a shame. Because um, my thinking was that I want something that's completely bootstrap. So after looking at 6502, I was like, well, the, 60, the, the Commodore 64 emulator is extremely complex. It's more complex than I can grasp. I think it's pretty limit of what a, a single person can understand. It seems like a simple system. I mean, you can look at it, it's just this box, but for one person to write an emulator for it, it's more than a weekend project. And I was looking for something that I could nail in a single weekend. So 6502 has a whole bunch of uh, mnemonics. Implementing the 6502 core, like the just the, the, the VM, at, well, the 6502 as a VM is maybe like, a, you can make a naive implementation in a week maybe like a weekend project if you don't do anything else. 
but my my knowledge of C is is very is quite limited and and bad. Uh, but luckily, I had, had a, I had help. But my thinking was that can this instruction set be reduced further? And so I, it got me thinking about complexity and what simplicity m means. There's a uh, Andre, <laughs> Andre San, uh, uh, Kolag Monarov, uh, the mathematician, said that the index of complexity of any one system is the length of the program that could generate a specific string. And I really liked that uh, way of looking at complexity and simplicity because nowadays it's sort of convoluted if you don't really know about hardware. It seems that everyone's instantly trying to make the programmer comfortable and not making a, an actual fast product. I mean, everyone that I know, most of the people I know who are programmers, they, they use t type systems and s memory safety and all these sort of training wheels. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like, I want to reduce the problem space to like as little a thing I can make it. And I know myself, I'm a, I don't like programming that much. And in the future, I'm gonna hate it probably even more. So I, I want my future self to be able to reimplement my entire system at most in a weekend. So where does that bring me? Uh, 6502 is sort of like beyond the scope of what I was hoping to do here because having done it twice, I don't think I'll have it in me to do it again. Uh, but so I start to look back at the same era with Bell Labs and all these sort of like people. And there were a time when people would build these paper computers to teach kids to understand how, you know, what a program coin program counter is and how things move around in a program and navigate bytecode. And I thought that was kind of cool. A paper computer, nobody can take it away from you. As long as you have paper and pen, you are you can still solve problem, albeit slowly and uh, more painfully, but this is a form of computing that can really be easily ported. When I was looking at the BBC uh, Domesday thing, I noticed that Alan Kay, who, who did, who did um, small talk, also had a project that was sort of in line with what I was trying to do. He thought, well, small talk can be small talk is a is a VM, and how much of a small talk, uh, how much of a small VM can be possibly uh, run small talk 72? So he wrote this paper called the Chiffier. Well, I think it's called cuneiform of cuneiform tablets of computers, something like that. Uh, I mean, uh, Alan Kay had all these uh, these words to talk about computers that that, that are very sort of viral. He, he, he said like. Lisp was the Maxwell equation of programming, which you know, as a minimalist uh, geek, I was like, "Yes, this, this, this is what I want." But then you learn. I mean, you look into Lisp, and and I don't think a language that creates garbage by design is really what I was looking for. Uh, I, and this was a bit more like it, but it was a register machine, and I didn't see how that mapped to sm Smalltalk. Uh, so, so then I was like, "Okay, so Chiffier is." is not exactly what I'm looking for, but there are plenty other ways of doing uh, computing out there that are that could be applied to what I'm looking for. So, so instantly you fall on one instruction set computers, like this sublec, for instance. Uh, it's a disgusting tar pit, but uh, I can implement it in 15 minutes. And I would be really kind for my future self to make a system that runs on something that could be implemented in 15 minutes. The problem with that is that the tool chain required to write things that you can be that can actually have any purpose is immense. Like there were people who, who wrote C compilers down to sublec, and just looking at this, it's like you sh it shifts the whole complexity back to uh, the compiler thing, and that doesn't resolve really my problem. There were computing uh, paradigms which I absolutely loved. There were that they, they were so pure and so beautiful, but at the same time they mapped so poorly to silicon that they didn't really work for me, but I, want, I, I meant to mention this one because it's one of my favorite. Uh, Two is an esoteric programming language that has one, also one operator, and it only has a replacement rule. So you have an, you have an accumulator, which is a series of character, and every, every rule on every line is just a replacement of what's on the left with what's on the right, and turns out it's extremely powerful. It's very slow, but it's extremely powerful, and implementing it at 30 minutes Fractron is another one of code uh, system. Uh, it has only one of code and it's multiply, but it's 
primitives are not uh, bytes or shorts, uh, it, it's fractions, and it uses uh, prime encoding, which is one of the most beautiful mathematical concepts that I know of. Uh, and I was, for a while I was like, that's it, I found it, this is my bedrock, I'm gonna use fractions to make computers. <laughs> uh, turns out it really it maps poorly to computers. Ski calculus is beautiful, it has this mathematical elegance to it. Uh, I went down that rabbit hole and I barely emerged uh, alive, uh, but I recommend everyone to take a Lisp detour and then learn Ski and read Smolian and all these people who really don't care about making products, but really want to explore software in a way that is very creative and artistic. Uh, I almost made this my 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 bedrock, uh, except that at a VM space, garbage collection was a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> Everyone knows, I mean, like, so I, I didn't know what to expect coming I mean, here, right? So I, I, like a month ago, like two months ago maybe, I, I, a friend of mine was like, you know, like all this shit that nobody understands what they're talking about, you should really go to Seattle and you, you'll, you'll be in your crowd, they'll understand there. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, you know, like nobody cares about that, st that sort of stuff. And like, I've been drinking last night with people and I was like, whoa, these people are nerds. And I, <laughs> it's like, no, no, I can, no filter, I don't have to, cuddle anyone, everyone's familiar with this, everyone is in the same sort of thing, and obviously everyone knows brain fuck. I, didn't, I was like, why do I have a slide for this? Um, well, okay, so brain fuck has seven instructions. Implementing it is, would be like 45 minutes, maybe an hour. So like we're going up the abstraction chain here, and my thinking was that, well, the, it's, the, the pattern I was seeing is, obviously this, the lesser mnemonics or complexity that you reduce it to, the slower it gets. Uh, Brain fuck is surprisingly fast. Like you can have these Mendelbrot system run, uh, and on a system that is quite f short to implement, and I was surprised how fast it was. But obviously, I, won't, I don't. That's not the sort of programming I want to be doing. The but then that led me to something, another system. So someone was like, "Okay, I think I know what you're trying to do. Uh, do you know Chuck Moore?" And I, uh, like didn't never came up to my in my books about Stanford. And it must must have been some sort of outsider. Um, there were these FPGA things. I mean, if even the word FPGA, I think it's the first time I say it out loud. Uh, it's not something I'm very quite familiar with, but people were trying experimental computing systems on these things because you, it, doesn't ma it doesn't matter. It's, 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 a, it's goo. You can, flex, you can make it and shape it in any way you want. And someone wrote this VM or yeah, system, FPGA system, called uh, J1. It's a fourth system. I mean, even at that point, fourth was like, a what? Uh, it has very few opcodes, but the, it was one of the most beautiful mapping of bytecode I, I had ever seen before. It, the stack machine uh, primitives were implemented so you could combine them with each other. It, it created, it created Weird combination with weird combination of bit toggles and a, on a bytecode, you could have these really interesting sort of esoteric stack manipulators, and I I was smitten. Uh, it's a 16-bit fourth system, so you know the biggest number that you can have in biggest liter literal biggest literal you can have in in, in one of those uh, words would be like 35,000 uh, uh, fixed, and uh, the arithmetic thing was, was really beautiful. I really like this, but the whole system, this maximum uh, program that it can run, I think it was four kilobytes, and what I had in mind was slightly more than four kilobytes, but not much more. I, I, was, I, I was like, well, 60, like, if I can have a full addressable 64, would be really nice. I don't want the complexity of, of the 6502, so what, what else was out there? The chip eight is a really nice system. I uh, know, I'm mean, sorry. I mean, it's an interesting uh, system uh, that has a rich, vibrant community of people who, who build things for it during game jams. Uh, the spec is quite simple. It fits on, on maybe two, pa two pages of paper, side by side. It's very, it feels like the paper computer in ways that I like, but also uh, I think it was 
not designed to be a general purpose uh, driving VM. It's really meant to be like building things like in the scale of Pong. Um, the keyboard is like this hex keyboard with just numbers on it. Uh, I wanted something that uh, my plan was really to build something that I could build itself in it. So I want a keyboard. I want maybe like a cursor. Uh, just a just a weird keyboard for me would not cut it. Machine fourth was something I stumbled upon after. So Chuck Moore wrote fourth, and he was like, you know, it's too complicated. And you're like, what, what do you mean it's too complicated? There's like no syntax, no nothing. Like it's space divided language. Uh, uh, with basically no, like implementing a fourth system is really fast. And Chuck Moore was like, well, being being himself was like, ah, all this cruft uh, I, I can do without. And so, so he reduced even further to machine fourth, which I think, I forget how many, I think it has 32 upcodes or 24. I kept seeing fourth over and over again, and I couldn't really grasp or see the beauty in it for a while. I mean, obviously, if, you, if, you've, if you've just come from Lisp, you sort of have a whiplash when you <laughs> fall in fourth. It has similar beauty. Uh, one is, you know, Lisp would be infix, but fourth would be pre, uh, prefix. And obviously, you, you go in that, that mindset where you're just like, well, infix, oh, that is like the algo language. They're like, you, you could be anyone, or you can do anything, and you chose to be algo. Why? Uh, uh, but going going back and forth between Fort and Lisp, uh, I couldn't really make up my mind. But I kept seeing people who would uh, who, who would would fall in love with with Fort, and they were really bad at selling it. Uh, and and it had this sort of culture of uh, well, you know, like Lisp, it's really hard to find any Lisp code that you can actually copy paste in your project because oh, obviously they're using all these weird macros and libraries and things, and it, nothing is portable. Well, Fort has it had a different problem. Everyone was like, yeah, Ford is the best. You should really use it. And then you're like, all right, how do I calculate the distance between two points? <laughs> it seems like a lot of people like Ford but didn't write it. Uh, <laughs> it was hard to find just a polygon filling library, uh, a routine. I mean, I know Ford is not portable, but it was hard to find just actual use, use code of Ford that wasn't like, someone trying to learn Ford by implementing Ford and then moving on back to Rust. <laughs> uh, the way Ford works is really simple. You just put stuff on a stack, hits a upcode, put, pulls the items on the stack. It doesn't have rule precedence. And uh, it seemed like a really good bedrock for the things I wanted to do. I couldn't really find a fourth that was like, machine fourth was something that was going to be something close to the metal. Fort at its core is something pretty close to assembly, but I wanted something that mapped exactly to assembly. I wanted something that would be like one fourth word would be one byte or one short. So after a while, I was like, you know, I'll build, I'll pick a, a bunch of, of, of upcodes, and I've shown it to my friends, and they were like, these are bad. <laughs> uh, and it's people I trust. And uh, actually, I, I should take a moment just to say, you know, all of this, all of this adventure. If I was on my own, I would have given up and not done it, and I would be probably writing JavaScript still. A and uh, but there were people who were extremely pa patient with me. They kind of they understood what I was trying to do. They were like Sigrid, uh, Alderic, uh, Andrew, people who, who had infinite patience for my stupid questions, and they were like. I wouldn't do it this way, but here's something that you, that you could use to, to improve your system. And in the end, I ended up with this napkin definition, well, this uh, definition of, uh, of a system that I kind of liked. Uh, my goal th throughout this whole process was to make a system that fitted on a t-shirt. Because I was like, you know, I might lose my computer, especially on a sailboat, you never know. Uh, and uh, I don't want to like, keep preserving all this the documentation, because w when I started sailing, I was doing a bit of Ruby, and then I was like, all right, I'm going to get all the Ruby documentation I need uh, to be self-sufficient. And what, like, it's immense. Like, you, you, need, you need all this, this, this stuff to, to know. It's like, imagine that, you, imagine that tomorrow Stack Overflow is gone, right? Like, we, we go at sea, we spend 50 days at sea without internet, and then you're like, oh, shit, what is it again? How to, you know, like, you know, fill 
a, a polygon or something. And then it, like, oh, well, I should really look it up. Oh, I can't, but if I had printed it. But there are languages that make this more accessible and others that make it really hard. Not having a, bi a big background in C, I found it really difficult to, to, go, to go off sailing without my, docu my C documentation, right? So, but it's extensive. It's really, it's really clunky, and my thinking is that I'm probably going to lose, lose the book at some point in the future, and my future self, uh, if I had that t-shirt, would be probably okay. So I, 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 tr I tried to reduce everything that I could do on a t-shirt. That's as much as I afforded in bandwidth. Uh, so the, the language that I made, I'm not going to talk about languages. I'm just showing you this week, so because it's less abstract, but I know Abner is like, no language this year. Uh, but just if, you know, if you're familiar with 6502 on the left, it just looks like this vertical series of instructions. And the language I made is basically quite similar. Like you can basically map it one to one. And the, and the resulting size of, bi of binary, uh, bytecode by is pretty much the same. So the only difference is that you might be familiar with this sort of assembly language as like a big vertical line of things, but I wanted to use the, the beauty of fourth and make language that would be like like verbose in ways that it, it looks like some sort of like English a little bit. Like uh, every morning when I wake up and I open my programs, I don't hate myself for not leaving myself comments because the code itself is a bit more readable and uh, self-documenting. Uh, the first thing I tried to do is to as make an assembler in that language. Uh, and it was easy. Uh, the, the language is so simple that obviously the assembler itself is going to be simple. And then I made the, I generated a x86 uh, application of the VM that could run its own assembler in that language. And, and then I was like, well, that's it. I just did what Zig did last week. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. Uh, the assembler is, is very, it's like a, I think it's 3,000 kilobytes. Uh, 3,000 bytes, sorry. Uh, that's what it looks like. Um, so I have a, a chip thing uh, that uh, something like the 6502 is a thousand comma. It's nothing like a computer, uh, but it, it will run bytecodes. Now, I'm not going to go into like the devices and all that sort of stuff, but uh, I, I felt like I reduced s the problems that I was solving in computers down to 32 things. And these 32 things, I think I could probably implement them in Fractran and Sublec and all these other more minimal computing system. But it taught me about how the, the little functions you would use in JavaScript to convert a string into an int while well, you, you write it in assembly and it dispels the magic. I mean, people, sometimes they say they love magic, but in truth, they don't. And I didn't like magic at all. And especially not when starts, things start to break. I think it was uh, Douglas Adams said something like, there's the difference between something that can fail and something that can never fail. And the thing that is designed to never fail is the one where, when it fails, it's really hard to get to. And with programming, that was the situation I was having. I wanted to be able to understand the whole thing on my, in myself, and everything had to be inspectable. So from there, I started to build uh, screens, routines, uh, screen, uh, like buffer filling, that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I started to make uh, implementations of basic, of games, of other, emula other emulators. And for two years now, I've been writing in this little language I made. And Bob was saying, you know, like, encourage everyone to make their own programming language and their own system. And I think it's a sort of like, we all share this here, but you go out there and it's sort of frowned upon. I remember the first time when I mentioned it, people basically laughed me out of the room, uh, especially because they were like, you, you, you're, you draw. Like, what, what do you even know about computers? Uh, but I think now I'm like, I, I would love to see everyone's programming language, right? You meet someone and be like, yeah, show me how many upcodes you have. Or, or like, <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's telling about a person's uh, mind. So we built this little system that is completely tailored to host the little games we make. It, to anyone else, it will be alien. And the reason why I'm not sure, like, trying to sell you on this idea, what I'm trying to tell you is that you should try to f make your own personal computer instead of trying to piggyback on someone else's idea that's full of artifacts. 
I don't think we've even begun to scratch the surface of what can be done with little. A lot of people will try to tell you that 8-bit, oh, that's, you know, like, we've tried everything. But by the time the NES was out, most of the game genres that we have today didn't exist. They, like, there were uh, uh, immense amounts of space left to exploration, and now everyone has moved on, it's VR, and it's this and that. I made this entire talk in black and white, and I could have done the system in black and white, but I made it in four colors. Uh, I mean, imagine how much power you have with four colors. I think it's not like, one bit can be totally evocative, it doesn't have to be uh, uh, also like a pizza, all these colors. Like I think this maximalism of I need all these features and I need to be doing this and that. Like learning to live without float points is actually kind of nice. <laughs> and I think there's beauty in the really simple systems and like trying to like always scale, thing, scale things to fit everyone's uh, usage is 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 fool foolish. Uh, I'm I don't think. Uh, well, my attempt is the best solution to data preservation. It's, uh, I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to use that system in five years. Uh, but at least it's one uh, attempt at trying to preserve things. And permacomputing is the idea of that let's inspire ourselves from permaculture to build resilience. And, res and the resilience of permaculture comes from trying all these different ideas and seeing, seeing what sticks. If we all jump on the same language and the same ecosystem, it makes it really fragile when one individual can just buy the whole thing and then you're left with a system that is basically not yours. We write about these things and I rant about it on my website and you're welcome to uh, come and talk to me if you're interested in these ideas. Thank you. Yes.